Good morning. Welcome to Drayton Reformed Church on the somewhat cloudy, drizzly fall morning. It's good to be gathering here for worship, whether you are worshiping with us here in person or gathering with us online. We are glad to be worshiping together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. As always, for those who are gathered here in this church building, we encourage you to maintain some appropriate physical distance and also, if possible, to keep those face coverings on after worship until you get to your vehicles. We would sure appreciate it. And we also want to remind everyone, uh, both here and at home, of the various ways you can give. You'll see this announcement week to week in the Connect Bulletin that gets sent out on Fridays. Uh, On that note, if you're not getting emails or uh, would like to receive emails, let us know and and we'll gladly get you on that list. It includes the bulletins as well as the link to the YouTube channel, so you can click on that on Sunday mornings to join the live stream, although if you're watching, you clearly have already got that. Um, But anyway, uh, as far as giving, um, uh, on Sunday mornings here in church, you can drop off your offering uh, for a little while after church as well. Um, You can also mail in uh, a check or something like that to the church and just uh, designate that to the deacons and we'll see that it gets to them. Uh, Quite a few people have already set up the pre-authorized payment or PAR pre-authorized giving. Uh, If that's something you're interested in setting up, it's as simple as uh, filling out a form. So just let us know if if you uh, would like one of those forms. And you can also give through the Tithely website. Uh, And uh, again, that's all in the Connect Bulletin that goes out each week on Friday. So you can check that out. Or if you have further questions about that, let us know and and we'll find you an answer. But it is good to be gathered for worship this morning in God's name. And we come here to this house of worship at our Lord's invitation. So people of God, grace, mercy, and peace be upon you in the name of God and our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's join our hearts before God in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, fill our worship with grace, that every thought, every word, and every deed may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I invite the worship team to come forward, and as they do so, The psalmist calls us to worship today with these words. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell of all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and exult in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Most High.
seated. As we come here to worship our Lord, we know that our lives are often not aligned with our Lord's will. Our loves don't match God's loves or what God would have us love. Our concerns are often for lesser self-seeking things rather than for the kingdom of God. And so as we come before God in worship, it's also appropriate that we join our hearts before God in a prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Lord God, sometimes our lives have such little focus. We have so much to do. We possess so much stuff. We're driven by the need for still more. And it easily seems to control us. We are sorry, Lord, for how distracted we become and for losing our way without even realizing it. Forgive us and help us to know that you are the only one we need. Amen. Friends, here is the good news. As Scripture tells us, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. In the name of Jesus Christ, there is full forgiveness. Thanks be to God. For our children's time this morning, we continue to journey with our Sunday school leaders as they lead us through the Superbook Academy. So at this time, let's turn our attention to the screen to see what our Sunday school leaders have for us today. Noah and the Ark. God fulfilled his wonderful promise to send a Savior to save us, forgive our sins, give us new life, and fill us with the power to live for him. We've learned about obedience by faith and living to please God. Today we're going to talk about how God keeps his promises and the importance of prayer. God's Holy Spirit lives inside all believers. He helps us pray in harmony with God's will. So today I have two two bottles, and I'm going to have you pick one of them up, Amanda, and I want you to tell me what it is and what the ingredients are. So start with this one. Okay. So this is a bottle of water, and it really is just water. Yep, 100% pure water, right? That's yes. That's probably what it says somewhere. Yes, no, no added ingredients, just 100% pure water. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Okay, now pick up this bottle and tell me what it is and what the ingredients are in that. Okay, well this is a bottle of pop, Coca-Cola, and the ingredients include carbonated water, sugar, glucose, fructose, caramel color, phosphoric acid, natural flavor, caffeine, and that's it. Wow, that sounds like a lot of ingredients. It does. And they don't even sound very good or very healthy. No. Sometimes when we pray, we pray our will instead of God's. We pray prayers that may be selfish, foolish, or unwise. We may not even realize that we're praying this way. These are not pure prayers. In other words, they have additional ingredients that may be harmful or unnecessary. They may be a mixture of our own selfish desires. Let's all continue to pray that God will fulfill his promises in our lives. Praying God's will and his word are pure prayers that are effective every time. So today's super truth is God always keeps his promises. Say it with me, Amanda. God always keeps his promises. Now let's hear you. Awesome. And today our super verse is, when I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. 
And that's from Genesis 9, 14 and 15. Mm. And that was the last time the earth experienced a flood over its entire surface at the same time. God's promise to Noah has never been broken. And it never will be because God always keeps his promises. Always. Yeah. So that wraps up our lessons on Noah's Ark. Join us next week to see the Tower of Babel lessons. Uh, this week for your activities, here's some. You can do a fun crossword. You can make a little ark. So go online on your parents on the teacher's resource and, and check out some of the cool things that you can do. Perfect. They look like a lot of fun. We also still have our children to think about. So remember to do the World Vision offering if you can. Uh, it's on the Tithely website. Yes. Good remembering. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to pay the price for my sins. Forgive me for everything I've done wrong. Remind me to come to you quickly when I sin in the future so that I can confess my sins and receive your forgiveness. Thank you for your promise that someday you will take me to be with you in heaven to live with you forever. Please give me the power to tell others the good news of your love and salvation. In your name I pray. Amen. They're just having too much fun doing those, aren't they? And I'm having issues. Okay. Well, good morning. It's good to be able to bring God's Word uh, to you this morning. Um, we find ourselves midway through a sermon series today on the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to invite you to turn there in your uh, Bibles or on your mobile devices at home. You can join us as well to turn there to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And just like that, I had three bars and now down, downs to zero. So, Paul, you might have to help me out when I say next. We'll try these batteries for a second. One bar is better than zero. All right. <clears throat> we'll see how that goes. So we are uh, doing a sermon series entitled Love Is. A total of 11 messages on the topic of love. Now that might seem like a lot of talking on love. For some of you, it might be like beating a dead horse. Um, and I know at times in the past, I, when I've got onto a topic um, and, I, and I felt it was really necessary to prove the point, I kind of went overboard. And sometimes I went so far that I swayed any possibility of anybody even agreeing with me. Um, can you identify, ever have your kids say, oh no, here you go again. Or, I know what you're going to say before you even say it. Been there? Um, how do they know? Well, because likely you've beat that horse pretty good. And it doesn't have much breath in it anymore. But I really believe we are not doing that here on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're not doing that. Um, because the biblical idea of love is so incredibly important to our faith and to our lives. It is so important to those that God chooses to bring into our lives. And so, can I say this this morning? It is imperative as Christians that we understand what true biblical love is, what it looks like, 
and exactly how we ought to implement it into our lives. One pastor mentions that after counseling many hundreds of hours, individuals, couples, families, himself, he mentions as well, he was convinced that most of their problems result from a failure to understand what it means to really, truly love people. Or, if, if the understanding was already there, he found that the problems became a failure to implement, not just knowing it, but implementing biblical love toward other people. And so, I believe it is utmost importance for us to know uh, how to love, but also, very importantly, that if we really love biblically, it is God in us and not ourselves. If I were to smile and say a kind word here or there, and, and all that, that was just love, it would be pretty easy. But there's so much more to this biblical understanding of love as we are learning together these weeks. And just as importantly, might I add, we must understand that our motive to love biblically comes from, is rooted in, our love for Christ Himself. So having laid that as a bit of foundation by way of introduction, uh, we're going to begin where we left off last week. But let's read that chapter again, verse, or chapter 13. Let's read that passage. Paul writes, and now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I possess all I pos- if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we shall see, but but a poor reflection, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Not sure if we're going ahead. Maybe not. What's that? I got one bar. <laughs> can you just, can you just uh, forward ahead there, Paul? Good, excellent. All right, so as we look at this word, um, the word love in this passage, as Daniel and I have mentioned in weeks prior, um, this is the word agape. It's the Greek word for agape. It is the highest form of love. It is selfless. It is sacrificial. 
It is unconditional. It is a love that transcends and persists regardless of any circumstance you find yourself in. This is the love Paul speaks throughout this chapter. Now, the chapter starts with Paul saying that this kind of love is absolutely essential for the Christian walk. Absolutely essential. This kind of love that that he uses, agape love, you may be able to speak eloquently. You might be able to communicate with the best of them. But if this kind of love isn't present, it means nothing. You might be as smart as a whip. You might be the head of your class. You might be the best in your field of expertise or do really good at what what you do for your your job or for your vocation. You might be really good. People, People look to you and and, and look to you for advice and, and help, whatever fields you are, You're, you find you make your way up the ranks and you find yourself in a leadership position. You might know the Bible in and out. You might have a handle on theological doctrines and talk anybody under the table. But if there isn't any love... It means absolutely nothing, Paul says. You might be the most generous, most selfless, most giving person on earth. You're always thinking about somebody else. The strange part about this is if this agape love is not detected, Paul is saying, you're no further ahead. That's how Paul starts. He sets the foundation. This kind of love is absolutely essential. It's foundational to the Christian life. And then Paul moves on to tell us what this agape love does and does not do, what it is and what it isn't, what love looks like more practically. So we're going to pick up from where we left off last week when Pastor Daniel led us to reflect on two phrases in verse 5, love does not dishonor or is self-seeking. Today, we are going to look at one phrase in the middle of verse 5, and if you can move that next slide, Paul. Not too sure if you can see that. Love is not irritable. Now, we're going to be focusing on that. Maybe, maybe the slide before, what do you have there? Nope, next slide, next slide. Okay, there we go, perfect. All right. Love is not irritable. Now, the reason I chose this, uh, this is the English Standard Version translation. We just read love is what? Not easily angered. Right. The New American Standard Bible says love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily angered. Next slide. Oh, next slide. So, para, para oxuno. Paroxuno, that's what it says, paroxuno. That's the pronunciation of the Greek, paroxuno. means to irritate, to provoke, aroused anger. Have you ever been irritable? Don't nudge the person beside you and say, I didn't see you nodding. Have you ever been provoked to anger? If you're human, I think the answer is yes. Have you ever heard of the expression flying off the handle? That guy just flew off the handle. Or, why is it always when you get angry, you fly off the handle? It's a phrase that alludes to the uncontrolled way a loose axe head flies off from its handle, flying through the air. Can you imagine the potential danger of that? No one wants to be around when an axe head is flying through the air out of control. Even if it doesn't hit you on the sharp end. 
If it's still attached to the handle, it's relatively safe, but off the handle, you've got to look out for your life, right? When that happens, someone is going to get hurt. When a person flies off the handle in difficult situations, someone is always harmed. You know, just, th- this, this has spoken to me as a parent. <laughs> because there's times when I've been provoked. And I've been irritable. And I didn't have the filter. And all I wanted to do was discipline or whatever. And at the very end of the day, it didn't harm me. It harmed my child. I think this really speaks to us. Because we might have grown up with a parent who flew off the handle very easily. And that's how we learned how to express anger. Perhaps we have a child that flies off the handle easily. Well, how do they learn that? So this is so important as Paul talks about love. When emotions are out of control, often someone gets physically or emotionally hurt and unfortunately physically hurt in some cases. Love does not have fits. It doesn't get out of control. It does not fly off the handle. And so the Bible is full of warnings and examples for us regarding staying in control of ourselves. There are illustrations of the kind of damage that is done when we don't. Next slide. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent, the wise, overlook an insult. Consider the person who is quickly and easily upset. They're annoyed. Though how it looks might look in many different forms, the point is the person gets very angry very quickly and very easily. Easily offended. Has a short fuse. You might say that person's quite prickly. And instead of being being slow to anger, he's quick to anger. Irritableness is seen by everyone, ticked off, and you know it by his words, his facial expressions, the tone of voice, his put-downs, his withdrawal, his distance, even too. And the next verse. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. Very similar. Now, emotions are a part of our God-given makeup. Would you say amen? Emotions are good things. I'm glad to have emotions, and I'm glad to experience and watch other people have emotions. We are emotional beings. There's no question about it. But emotions are not to drive us, to rule us. We're to be in control of them. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Again, this is an attempt for us to better understand what it means that love is not irritable. Next slide. This is what Paul writes in Titus. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. In four phrases, yeah, that's good, just leave it, yep. In four phrases, Paul shows us how we ought to function as Christians, and they paint us a picture of what it means to have a love that is not provoked. The first phrase here is to speak evil of no one. When an irritated or provoked person well, is provoked or irritated. <laughs> to, to speak evil of someone, we could put it in maybe in a, in a more of a, a phrase that we might understand, is they bite back. They bite back. 
Get irritated. A person gets irritated, watch out. They will cut the other person down to size. And we know the people we love the dearest and closest to us, we know where to get them. We know what makes them tick. And sometimes we use our words as a reaction to cut them at their knees. To not... So think about the last time you were irritated or provoked to anger. Think about it. If you ever were. Did you ever... Were you tempted to go after that person with your words? Did you assign blame to them? Um, Did you jump to conclusions? Did you focus on their wrong? Did you hone on in their weakness? Let's look to Jesus for a moment. When Jesus was about to be crucified, and even while being crucified, where we think he might be most locally, most likely provoked or irritated, he was not. Think about this. Jesus was mocked. He was blindfolded. He was beaten. He was taunted. He was teased by then saying, Who struck you, Jesus? They misrepresented him. They hurled abuses. They twisted his words. And how did Jesus respond? We don't see an irritable, provoked person. A beautiful picture of someone who was under control. The second phrase that Paul tells us is just avoid quarreling. We are not to be contentious with another person. People who are easily provoked become argumentative, quarrelsome. They are verbal brawlers. Everything is a debate. Everything is a debate to be won. However, a person with real love will seek to be peaceful, not quarreling with anyone. Romans 12 verse 18 says this, if possible, as far as it depends on the other person, live peaceably with everyone. That's not what he says there. If possible, as far as it depends on on you. Live peaceably. We are ought to be pursuers of peace. We've got a desire to be a peacemaker, not a quarreler. We've got to go the extra mile. But doing anything short of abandoning truth to make peace with all. Love is not irritable. The third thing that... Uh, Paul says, our lives should be characterized by gentleness. Many think that gentleness is something you just have or you don't have. It's just a personality trait. But all Christians are to possess it. If you don't have gentleness, pray for it. Practice it. A person who is not provoked or who is not irritable is one who is gentle, a submissive person, unselfish, One who does not demand his or her own way. It's a person who is able to handle opposition to his own will or disagreements with being provoked. That is so important. Can you stay connected in a relationship when the other person disagrees with you? Strongly disagrees with you? Or does the anxiety start to rise and you feel threatened? And you fight or you flee. That's what often happens when we have disagreements. We have disagreements all the time. How do we handle that? Do we become irritable and and provoked? Or are we willing and able to, to stay there and to be calm? The last phrase is to show perfect courtesy toward other people. Not just, he doesn't say just courtesy, he says perfect 
not just a little, but perfectly to all people, for the, even those who are sinning against us. Now, talking about all of this, love is not irritable. It might be easy for us to say, you know what? I just can't live that way. I get provoked. I do become irritated with people, my family, my friends, my coworkers. I get irritated with mean people. I get irritated with arrogant people, with people who try to tell me what to do. Oh, 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 oh I get irritated. I get irritated with people who confront me or want to correct me. I become easily with ir- easily irritated with people who sin against me again and again and again. I can't hold it all together. I do fly off the handle. If that is who you are, if that is where we are, and we are all there at one time or another, if that is where you are or you know of somebody that is there, then there is hope. And here is where we must focus. Here is where we get practical help. We get it in the gospel message. Our help comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is our motivation. You want to see it? Let's stay in Titus. The next slides. I'm just going to read this through. Follow along with me, please. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated others and hating one another. What's the next word? That's where we were. Now we pivot. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared... He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, not the right things and good things we've done, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, being made right, In God's eyes, by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Do you get that? Do you see what Paul is saying? What has God done for us? Everything. Our rescue is in Him. Our future joy is in Him. Our stability in this life is in Him. Our security is in Him. He has loved us with mercy. He has given us His Spirit through Christ. He has given everything. And so here we are as those who in Him can live radically. Did He radically show His love for us? Yeah, He did. And He calls us to live a radical life, a radical love. Now you may ask yourself, is there ever a time I can get angry? You might think about Jesus getting angry in the temple. Paul doesn't rule out righteous indignation. He doesn't rule that out. Because we can be righteously angered when somebody else is mistreated. Do you ever get angry and upset when somebody else is mistreated unjustly? That's 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 a righteous anger.
when someone else is treated wrongly, we get upset. Or we can become righteously anger, angry if God is spoken ill against. Jesus cleansed the temple. He was angry. He was, he was livid at the Lord's house being used other than a place of worship. So for Paul, like his Lord, he was only angered by the things that angered God. But Paul never got angry at the people that jailed him or lied about him. The point what Paul is saying today is love never reacts in self-defense or retaliation. So love is not irritable. There's hope. Our love can be without irritation, without throwing fits, without flying off the handle. So the question is, how will you do today and this coming week? If you know you're prone to having a short fuse with other people, how are you going to respond? When that time comes, not if, when that time comes, may I suggest that you take a deep breath and you you pray a quiet prayer, Lord, help me to be gentle with this person. Help me to love this person and not harm them. And perhaps take a few moments to look at Titus this week, at the passages we reflected upon this morning, and allow it just to to sink in. Allow it to to, to just flood you and, and saturate your soul. Love is not irritable. To God be the glory. Amen. I invite the music team to come forward.
Let's join our hearts before God together in prayer. God, we praise You this morning for the opportunity to worship You together again. Lord, we praise You for Your goodness, for Your loving kindness, for Your faithfulness, and for Your love. We praise You, God, that You are not easily angered, that You are gracious and compassionate. We praise You for Your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who willingly died on the cross to make atonement for all of our sins and to draw us into unity with You as Your beloved children. God, we praise You for Your care over the creation around us. As the leaves continue to fall and as we see frost in the mornings, we remember that the seasons turn according to Your sovereign plan and that even time is held within Your hands. God, we praise You for the beauty of Your creation from the vast expanse of stars in the nighttime skies to the autumn leaves that fall to the ground, from the sun rising and setting to the produce of the earth that we can eat and enjoy. Lord, we see Your majesty at work all around us in Your universe. Lord, we pray for Your world this morning. God, we pray for peace and for justice. We pray that You grant wisdom to community leaders and to politicians. God, we pray for leaders who work for the common good rather than for selfish gain. Lord, as much of our public lives continues to be shaped and affected by a pandemic, we pray for those at the forefront of research. We pray for those who work in the medical industry during this time of added stress and precaution. We pray for those who are especially isolated or lonely or who feel unsafe during this season. God, we pray for grace towards those whose opinions on these matters is different than our own. We pray that rather than driving division, we would be people of compassion and patience and understanding. And God, we pray for new breakthroughs to mitigate the effects and the spread of the virus. And God, we pray too for the concerns within our own church family. We pray for all those with health needs or concerns. We pray for those who are undergoing treatment or who are awaiting treatment. God, we pray for Albert as he receives treatment for cancer. We pray, that his, we pray for his strength and for his healing. God, we pray for Kobe as she continues to recover from a broken leg. We pray for patience and for a quick and full recovery. God, we pray for the families of Dirk, Freya, and John as they grieve the passing of their brother-in-law, Herman, in the Netherlands. And God, we pray for Your peace to uphold the family through Your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray for Alice and for her family, for Your strength, for Your peace, for Your comfort, and Your love to surround and uphold them in the face of the advanced stage of cancer in her body. Lord, we lift her up to You. Lord, we praise You that our hope in this world is not in what we build or what we accomplish, not in what we accumulate or grow, but in what You have already done for us in Christ Jesus. We pray that, Lord, we praise You that nothing can separate us from Your love for us in Christ. And God, help us to walk in that victory, in that hope, in that comfort, in that assurance that our good deeds might shine before others as a proclamation of Your goodness and Your love for Your glory. All this we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Part of our worship for God is, of course, giving of our offerings. You heard the announcement at the beginning of the service of the various ways to give. For those of you who are in the worship space, there are offering baskets at the entrances as you leave. May God bless you as you give. And let's continue to worship. Yeah. 
Dearly loved people of God, our Lord is slow to anger. He's abounding in love. And He sends you out with these words of love as a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you His peace. Amen. Thank you.